this. Hi, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Balika, Adrian Balika, who is a colleague of mine. He's also an associate professor up at Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson. He uh, is trained in, he went to medical school in Romania, and he just actually got back from Romania where he has set up a global program where he's taking some of our students out there and we're working on getting some of their students um, over to us. So he is kind of about a week back from, from a trip to Romania and happy to have him here. He did, he is double board certified in obstetrics from Rutgers and in internal medicine from Mount Sinai. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's it just actually, Dr. P, it's just I was looking for that uh, article that you mentioned. I said I, I was gone for three weeks and they published something else about hemoglobin one c and I still couldn't find it to, to, to comment on it. Um, I promise we're gonna be on time. Um, it just everybody wants to, to leave. We're gonna focus a little more on the pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. Yes, I, uh, I did a internal medicine residency I realize I'm not so, uh, so smart, so I switched to OBGYN, so your OBGYN's in the rooms. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, I have some experience uh, regarding both sides, and um, uh, you know, OB is an interesting uh, component to it. No disclosures. What we try to do is just for us to assess a couple of common medical uh, complications that can uh, pass from preconception, pregnancy, and postconception. Uh, we try to appreciate the differences. We already talked a little bit about uh, uh, one of them in gestational diabetes, and try to see what's the best pre and post uh, 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 pregnancy management for best uh, maternal and fetal outcome. So it's an interesting thing. So you switch to, when I switch to OB, just realize that you have two patients. It's an interesting component to it. Uh, we always had them gonna measure these outcomes, and we measure numbers, and we measure hemoglobin in O1C. Always the question is, that's the mom, but what's the outcome for the baby? So you always have a little bit different outcomes that you have to measure, uh, and we have to be aware of it. So we have the concept of preconception uh, care. So generally speaking, you know, we have significant uh, uh, potential for us to do better as an obstetrician or, you know, family physician. And this is this concept, what's the preconception care? So we have to identify intervention that basically modify biochemical, behavioral, or social risk to reduce preventable adverse outcomes. You can have poor outcomes of the pregnancy, but which are the preventable ones. Then came back the concept interconception care, which is actually the care provided between a delivery and the next pregnancy. And that's kind of a loose definition. And CDC came with this one, this interconceptional health. It's more of a CDC. And this is not new, this is 2006. And they say they're looking for intense intervention to women with previous adverse outcomes. So you can have uh, regular outcomes, you know, with the delivery, and you can do just regular as a physician, just regular care. And then in inter interconceptional health, this you have a more intense intervention for people and a patient and fetal a poor outcome in the past. So, you know, CDC in 2006 has this large report, and they said that OBGYNs who are involved in women's care, you know, family medicine, internal medicine, nurse midwives, nurse practitioner, to include preconception routine assessment, you know, through screening. And they're focused on 10 areas. And some of them, you know, were familiar with, some of them were not so familiar with, but each area individually that we can apply screening would be important. I think it's very easy nutrition, folic acid intake and weight management. I think as a primary care physician, this is an important, uh, important tool, you know? And the other one that we have common, we're talking about chronic diseases. If you can work, of course, on substance abuse, you know, tobacco and alcohol, that would be great. And the other thing that I don't know why my pet peeve is vaccination. You can vaccinate this uh, patient population prior to becoming pregnant would be a, a good thing for us as obstetrician. And if you're not an obstetrician, you know, the family planning, it's a little bit trickier, reproductive history, it's a little bit trickier. Obviously, environmental hazard and toxin is a little bit harder to control. But our focus should be in chronic diseases, you know, and definitely weight management, folic acid, and nutrition. And, you know, continue. That's a, Gabby has a, you know, medical condition that you can actually influence. This is a large table but actually it comprises what is it, all the talk is all about. 
So you can say we have opportunity for us to influence, you know, uh, um, you know, from psyche, from a, from age to weight. Age we cannot influence, but we can stratify. We can have psychiatric, uh, you know, uh, and uh, neurological disease. We can have cardiac, and then you have to see what your strengths are. Most of the times we intervene in hypertension, definitely have a coronary disease, and we have, you know, congenital heart disease that needs to be managed together with a cardiologist. You know, asthma, just, you know, look at the asthmatics and just make sure you, you, you have a, a good outcomes prior to pregnancy. And gastrointestinal, inflammatory bowel disease, if you approve with a GI all together, make sure they're managed prior to pregnancy. And uh, looking at diabetes, I think that's going to be our, most of our focus, diabetes and high blood pressure. And for us to see how we can evaluate this, how is difference in pregnancy versus non-pregnancy. Um, obviously, if you have a history of DVTPE prior to, to pregnancy, you have to make sure that you do a hematological workup and you just make sure you send these people to, uh, um, you know, high-risk doctors or obstetricians that are familiar with the disease. So the common medical condition I can look for is hypertension in pregnancy, diabetes, thyroid, you know, and obesity. It's a little bit of a change in pregnancy. This is what, we, what we, I learned when I started to transition. The pregnancy changes everything. So all the pathology and physiopathology that we learn, especially for internal medicine, was limited for us to teach about pregnancy. I mean, the most important things from this slide, just be aware, the pregnancy in the second trimester decreases, so the, uh, most likely with SVR. So what happened in this case? If you have a chronic hypertension patient and you're managing, sometimes you need to stop the medication or follow up the medication, anticipate this, this decrease so you'll be able for us to intervene. You don't want me to, be, to avoid hypertension during this time. Now some definition about hypertensive disorder in pregnancy. So there are a lot of definitions. One thing was the biggest one for me was the chronic hypertension versus, you know, in pregnancy. So what's chronic hypertension? So this chronic hypertension is the any hypertension present prior to 20 weeks of gestation. And chronic hypertension, then you become pregnant. Now you have chronic hypertension, but your blood pressure increase. And added new proteinuria, you develop chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. Gestational hypertension, nowadays it's going to go in obstetrics and it's going to do different layers. Gestational hypertension is hypertension developed after 20 weeks in a normal, uh, previously normal tensive person. And what's actually preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is gestational hypertension associated with proteinuria. So you're going to have a little kind of mix and match and you have to differentiate. But just keep in mind, prior to 20 weeks, we call it chronic hypertension in obstetrics. If you develop high blood pressure or proteinuria after, you develop or chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, or if you're fresh, gestational hypertension can change in preeclampsia if you add proteinuria. Chronic hypertension. So chronic hypertension was discussed before pregnancy or diagnosed before 20 weeks of gestation. So, um, you know, is defined in, in our literature is blood pressure more than 140, uh, diastolic and diastolic more than 90 or, or both. When do we intervene with the blood pressure medication? Okay, this is an important thing is. We're looking for kind of higher, 160 over 105. So in a, in a pregnant patient, antihypertensive medication is somewhat in this range of 160 over, over 100. Um, most of the chronic hypertension is actually end up being primary hypertension for you know, internal medicine people and family physician people. But you know, just 10% can be uh, related to other causes, which is a secondary type of hypertension, including renal and endocrine disease, most of our patient population. So once more, you know, chronic hypertension before 20 weeks or before pregnancy, we're gonna have, the, the, our numbers is 140 over 90. We do not have a pre, just, you know, pre-hypertension or have all these ranges. We have to be a little bit cautious with the intervention, and the, the idea is, so why don't you guys intervene? Because they try to kind of have to make sure you balance the perfusion, you know, uh, related to the hypertension, to the placenta and to the fetus, and balance it out with the cardiovascular risk, uh, immediate cardiovascular risk to the mother. 
So what's bad of chronic hypertension? Well, the chronic hypertension is, cannot support enforced preeclampsia. For us, obstetrician preeclampsia is a significant disease, has significant poor outcomes. And from a range around 10% of preeclampsia in a, in a general population of obstetric, if you have chronic hypertension, your risk goes to up to 40%. So it's almost if you're, you're hypertensive prior to pregnancy, the likelihood for you to develop preeclampsia it's up to 40% during pregnancy. So this matters to us. And remember we discussed about the pregnancy outcomes? You know, this is what actually important is. We're not looking at long-term cardiovascular risk. We're not looking, uh, you know, with looking at the lipids. We're looking what? What do we care as an obstetrician? C-section rate, postpartum hemorrhage, placental abruption. You can have growth restriction. So, Chronic hypertension, independently if it's a primary you know, hypertension or secondary hypertension, when you're looking at them from obstetrical outcome, if you made this transition, can give us the same problem. They can give us the problem through, even if, you know, through a lot of times to superimpose preeclampsia. Well, you know, say, well, that's fine, I understand. You bulk everything together, primary with secondary, is kind of a lot of variation. So listen, OB is a much, much simpler, you know. You know, we, from obstetrical outcomes, for the short duration of the pregnancy, what we care is for us to control the blood pressure, watch out for the superimposed preeclampsia, watch out for the maternal outcome, especially surgical, and watch out for the fetal outcome through this obstetrical uh, catastrophe like placental abruption or, you know, small for gestational age. So it's a little bit of a different view. We're looking at the fetus, we measure the fetus, we send people for ultrasound. This is the second patient. We always have the mom and we always have the baby. And the different way of monitoring the baby, they have different type of guidelines, which is not part of, you know, particular discussion today. You know, if you really want to go further, say, well, can we define why this patient has, you know, you can try to take a look of, you know, secondary hypertension. And these are suggesting finding that, you know, our ACOG put on a, you know, little box. You guys be aware. You don't have to learn more. But definitely, if someone has kidney disease in a family, if you do your, uh, you know, you come a chronic hypertension, what do you do? We do a set of labs. We do, uh, you know, and the creatinine is more than 1.1 or 1. It just make sure that you're looking for other causes. If you see a hypokalemic, what do you treat someone with chronic hypertension that just doesn't do very well? So this is a little bit different, you know, when looking at the, the, the secondary hypertension in the, in the internal medicine world. And what do you do? So that's fine, independently of, of uh, indication, most of the times it's primary. What do you do? We do a set of labs. We call it, you know, uh, preeclamptic labs. So, and what encounters? We need, you know, electrolytes. We need creatinine and BUN. Uh, we're looking at the liver enzymes, looking at the platelet counts. And looking on the bar, how much you know protein is in the urine, and said, you know, it's an interesting setup of labs. Say, so why? Because those are the, our preeclamptic labs. Any changes in the baseline that you know that you repeat the labs later in pregnancy help us to kind of make a differentiation between those. The very fine, uh, you know, it's chronic hypertension or superimposed preeclampsia. It's just a preeclampsia. Because what that doesn't matter, it's just for you to put in a category. No, because some of them we watch and some of them we deliver. And the, the time when you do the delivery, depending on the gestational age, is extremely important for the risk of prematurity. So those categories are important, not necessarily for us to, to get some guidelines. For us, it's important when we're going to deliver. Because if you have a superimposed preeclampsia or you have severe features, you have to deliver relatively soon. If you have someone with a mild preeclampsia that can watch, you try to buy each week, it's important for the, uh, for the, fetal, uh, for the fetal outcome. I always will tell you, it's just like dog years. The week, uh, one week, and someone in the just earlier gestational age is much more important than a week in the later gestational age. So 37 weeks to 38 weeks might not matter, but 24 weeks to 25 to 26 weeks matter. So when you make that type of indication for delivery, for the fetal outcome, that's extremely important for us. So you do the baseline. Everybody comes, chronic hypertensive, get a couple of blood pressure, uh, you know, high. We just try to do what we call the, you know, baseline preeclamptic labs, including a 24 hours urine protein. Now we go into a little medication. So 
you know, there have been, you know, what medication can you use? And as I told you, it's, they're so simple in OB. We have kind of quite straightforward. We have methyl dopa, which you know forever. What's the, you know, have childhood safety data up to seven years. What's the problem with the methyl dopa? It's not so effective in controlling, uh, you know, uh, worsening, you know, high blood pressure. So we are using a lot, we are using, but just do not work as well. Then we have the wonder drug that we hold the beta low. We have it just alpha and the beta blockers. You know, we can start with this homeopathic doses of 100 and 200, which I'm not necessarily going to change the, the outcome of the pregnancy, but give us an opportunity for us to titrate up. We just don't feel even including, and we titrate, and we titrate. And, you know, we can go up to 20, uh, 400 milligrams. I just have to tell you, when you're on that range, you know, start doubling up. 100, you know, twice a day, you know. Um, then, you know, r r quickly see how the patient reacts in a couple of days, and then you just start upping 200, and just be aggressive. Because if you don't have an immediate response to the initial early dose of what not in pregnancy, you can be a little more ag aggressive. Do not particularly wait very long. This is one of the OB mistakes. We're kind of afraid to use a lot of the medication. The patient's pregnant, doesn't want to take medication. And then you're going to see this trend of using this low dose of medication and then, uh, you know, still not controlling the blood pressure. Obviously, if you, they have asthma, be aware of that. Um, you know, congestive heart failure, hopefully and, you know, fortunately, we do not see so much in, 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 uh, in, in pregnancy. You know, nifedipin, pretty good, um, you know, except the sublingual form. Um, we use it. You start, you know, if you want to divide the doses. Uh, if not, initially we're concerned about dropping the blood pressure too much. Nowadays we can start at 30 and you can titrate up pretty quickly. Um, thiazide diuretics, you know, um, it's considered a second line agent. So even though there's no data regarding this, everybody's concerned about hypokalemia, reducing the, you know, the, the volume, but you know, has a bad rep. But that being said is you have you know, reasonable uh, opportunity. The bad drug is you know, ACE and uh, angiotensin re receptor blockers. So one thing that has to be is, of, of course, is associated with, with, uh, with um, anomalies, especially in the first trimester. The trick with this is just if you take care of a younger population that are on ACE and they're not on contraception, the trick is switch them to something else. When you see this patient population, if you can do it, that's the biggest. By the time they see the obstetrician, by the time you're going to call, by the time they find out they're pregnant, you're talking about, you know, most of the people are seven, eight, ten weeks in, in pregnancy. So, in, and why? 50% of the, the pregnancy in the United States, they're still unplanned. So it's pretty good number. You know, they're unplanned, and you're on, an a, you're on an ACE inhibitor, you know, you have to be aware. So be a little bit careful when you start a patient on an ACE inhibitor, if you have patient population younger with no contraception, you have to be, uh, you have to be aware of it. Especially the combination that they said, well, if the blood pressure is controlled, can I start the pills? Yeah, make sure you start some pills also, though, when you start an ACE inhibitor. Um, another thing that we can improve this in a chronic hypertension for us to decrease. Remember what we have a problem? Up to 40% preeclampsia. Just give them a baby aspirin, you know. And we're looking at the baby aspirin. Uh, you know, the, it's it's some improvement. You know, it's a few. It's just no downsides of of you, uh, using it. <laughs> So if you're a chronic hypertensive, it's very reasonable. If you have history of preeclampsia, it's very reasonable for you to start on a baby aspirin. You can start, you know, 12 to 16 weeks uh, uh, gestation can be comfortable starting on a baby aspirin. You know, the new, the new wonder drug right now, the old drug, metformin, also been some, uh, uh, the, the new data went from gestational diabetes actually, showed that we reduce the risk of preeclampsia, might or might not increase the risk of uh, preterm birth. So it's kind of double uh, 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 age serve. So remember, chronic hypertensive, we use labetalol, calcium channel blockers. You can use some diuretics if you want to. Methyl dopa, you can use it this forever. We don't use it as, as, as often. Uh, watch out for the ACE inhibitors and, uh, uh, um, and blocking agents. What you do, give a baby aspirin, and it's interestingly enough, might be a reason for you to, to use metformin on a diabetic patient. 
postpartum. So listen, I don't want to deal with the patients that are obstetrical patients, but they come to me right now. And then it's another kind of a mix and match high blood pressure issue, hypertensive disease in pregnancy. And you can still have preeclampsia up to like six to 12 weeks that, you know, postpartum hypertension, some preeclampsia pending, you know, proteinuria, no proteinuria or abnormal labs. So sometimes you might, might come, they deliver. We have that magic six weeks, but the patient might not show up and just follow up in your practice or in a family uh, physician practice that doesn't do OB or internal medicine. So be aware of the possibility. If they're very close to the delivery, do not particularly ignore. Said, well, they didn't have high blood pressure during pregnancy. Yes, but you know, it's, we have around one to 5% that can develop just first time high blood pressure, you know, preeclampsia or postpartum hypertension just in a postpartum period. Um, you know, we start using medication. What do you do usually? Well, you know, you can watch it a little bit, you know, make sure she doesn't have significant or, uh, features. If the blood pressure starts to go into this uh, kind of range, you might want to use the, what we discussed as, uh, as an intervention. You can put them on a better or you can put them on calcium channel blockers. Um, um, because the calcium can channel blocker is kind of a long acting, we, I personally like more labetal or giving you an opportunity to titrate. Um, definitely when you're more in the range of 160 over 110, you just don't let it go. I mean, just really, you know, these are kind of a cutoffs or intervene. In an acute event, pre, you know, pregnancy uh, and post-pregnancy, you just start treating them immediately rather than just send them home. Listen, your blood pressure is like 145, 150 over 95. Should I start, shouldn't I start? Maybe I'm gonna bring them back a week or two later, the diaries, you know, naturally a little bit, and then the blood pressure goes down and I put you already on, on calcium channel blockers. I mean, if it's labetalol, you can start with those smaller doses. If you're nifedipine, you have to start at 30. If it's a long acting, it's a little bit harder. So that's kind of what we see that, some, mm, should I start the patient or not? What do we do? Just bring them more often and ask them to do a blood pressure at home. Um, if they're, they're reliable, uh, reliable enough, if they can afford the blood pressure, and if it's uh, calibrated. Because listen, uh, 150 over, uh, you know, 150 over 90, um, 100 is less you, you don't treat. 160 you start treating immediately. So the range is already relatively close. So you have to have a pretty good calibrated machine. The other thing that happened, you know, in a postpartum is we use, you know, with a 30% C-section rate and, uh, uh, you know, pain, uh, that we switch from narcotics to more of a non-steroidal. Everybody is on non-steroidal and quite a significant amount. I mean, 800, you know, three, four times a day right now, it treats like, whoa, you know, we haven't seen the GI bleeds yet, but I'm sure they're gonna come up. So we treat and be aware, because sometimes it might be just medication related, especially if I now in the postpartum setup, they're doing fine and they have, have this complication and just suddenly, you know, you use this very large amount of non steroidal in a C-section and that be one of the cause. Obviously we know, we know if you have preeclampsia, you're at risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and actually even gestation diabetes in life. So, you, you know, it's possible for, for us to do, we just let the patient say, oh, I have gestational diabetes, I was, in pre I was just pregnant and it's gonna be fine. Said, listen, what I tell the patient, and you know, it's, uh, you know, I said, sometimes the pregnancy is the first stressor in your life. Sometimes I'm gonna tell you, it might just happen to you in the future. If you have preeclampsia, you have to watch for high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. You know, when you have gestational diabetes, you have to watch out. And the data show that, bending, you know, gestational diabetes is rampant, you know, after this, in some ethnic groups, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, quite, uh, quite high. Well, I said, um, 10 weeks, uh, 15 weeks, the patient is breastfeeding, because that's the other thing. After we cannot give medication or a lot of medication because they're pregnant, are the medications safe with breastfeeding? So. Most of the antihypertensive that we discussed are safe in breastfeeding. I think it is a question about the AC inhibitor, if you should use it as a larger dose. This is the, the thing is, if it's a theme is labetalol, calcium channel blockers, even, you know, methyl dopa if you want. You know, the patient who can breastfeed up to a year, that's not anymore obstetrician's problem. You know, the likelihood after six to, to eight weeks, you know, we don't want to deal with it, uh, just go to your doctor. So just kind of be familiar. Nowadays in, you know, hypertensive, you know, you can, you can use any kind of drugs nowadays. It's just pick and choose. So, you know, maybe not ACE for this patient population. 
And definitely, I just want to let them know. I mean, this is probably the most important. It's just lifestyle modification if you can. It's interesting. I mean, if the patient that's already previously sick and you're going to have a subset of sick people, but a lot of patient population is the first time that they encounter a physician on a regular basis. They might come for their annual, they might take some oral contraceptives, but this is the younger population. They haven't particularly been sick and suddenly have to come to, you know, in nine months to 15, 20 visits and then 10,000 labs, uh, a lot of genetic counseling, and the list is so long. It's a little bit, you know, stressful. But if you definitely, if you have an opportunity, it's a teaching moment. And I know we use it more in an educational component. Uh, you know, Lina Kashis with the medical students. It's a teaching moment. If we can be able to, to drill in this patient, preeclampsia and even gestational diabetes might affect this, that risk factors for you to develop in the future would be a great thing. The other way around, the obstetrician didn't say that. But you come and somehow, well, listen, I don't care what happened in pregnancy. It's not like that. You're going to say, hmm, whatever happened in pregnancy in this younger population, can I modify those rates? So it's another way for us to take a look at this. You know, I'm not so sure. Is pregnancy in the calculator? No, no. I was just curious about that. So it's interesting. So preeclampsia, if someone that's preeclampsia, you're going to talk about chronic hypertensive, because that's one you know. I put on medication, I'm doing my usual things. They're being on meds, I may switch to something else because they're breastfeeding, I switch to something that's gonna work, I titrate, I'm doing my job. But this preeclamptic, that was an event that happened in you know, OB maybe two years ago, the patient might or might not give you a, a, a good story, or well, the blood pressure was high. And I have to tell you, as an obstetrician, we don't actually take good notes. My resident said, you know, but how sick was she? Was she on magnesium, was she on this, and so on. It, it's, it's a checkbox, so be careful about it. If you have preeclampsia with this, if it was less than 37 weeks, or kind of each pregnancy that patient had preeclampsia, the recommendation is to do a yearly assessment of blood pressure, lipids, glucose, you know, and obviously watch for BMI. I mean, it's almost impossible in you know, a 15 minutes visit for you to do evaluation of all of this, but that's it. Did you have high blood pressure in pregnancy and the baby was delivered earlier? That's probably the best question. They will remember that. They might not remember, but the baby delivered automatically at 37 weeks. Because we have these discussions, you know. Said, uh, you know, we, you come here, your blood pressure is high, you have this toxemia or high blood pressure of pregnancy. You don't necessarily have to categorize with acute or not acute. We like to deliver the baby now. And that actually is, is something that the patient will remember. Might not remember, you know, the rest of what type of diagnosis, even they've been on, on, on magnesium. It's an interesting thing. It's a, the medication that you use for uh, prevention of seizures. There's so much intervention at that time on this patient population that another drug that still sats and just get drilled, they just, just do not know. You know, they get an epidural, they get a Foley, they get Pitocin, they might get a, uh, you know, balloon. Uh, you know, it's uh, pain medication, anesthesia, uh, nursing, monitoring, yeah, just another bag that to prevent. It's, it's very interesting. So have you been on magnesium? No. What they ask him, did you kind of feel sleepy at that time and so on? I said, oh yes, I, did just, I just didn't feel too good and so on. But you never know, could it have been the disease itself or could it be the magnesium. But for, you know, medic, you know medical is preeclampsia, just, you know, watch out for this, less than 37 weeks. So it's an interesting number. Now we're going to switch a little bit to diet, gestational. We already had a discussion. I promise I'm going to finish on time. Uh, during the pregnancy, gestational diabetes. We have the universal screening at 24 to 28 weeks. You know, most of the obstetrician, they use 50 grams. There are a lot of discussion, you know, two grams, hemoglobin A1C combination. I think 95% of the, you know, use the screening of 50. We go to uh, uh, three, uh, three hours. We use two values. You have four. And, uh, you know, this is the cutoff, it's interesting. Between 130 and 140 is no wrong answer. You just have institution to pick. And I think we pick 135, it's just we're in the middle over there. So with no particularly data or reason, we just said, let's make it 135. And that's our general B practice. And then I had to go to MFM, which I think they were more aggressive. I think they were 130. So then we have to come all together back to 135 based on our patient population. We call them A1, A2. <coughs> because you use pharmacological intervention versus not. 
And this is diagnostics criteria. So you do your screening, come back for follow-up. We use the, actually the carpenter to stun uh, conversion rather than uh, national diabetes. As you can see, the numbers are 95, 180, 155. Two of these values being abnormal, we call them diabetic one. We put them on a diet, we put them, I don't know, they cannot exercise too much in, in pregnancy, but definitely would like to be, become more active. And um, we never use this one. Uh, we just have to pick up a little more diabetes. Our patient population tend to be diabetic. Then, you know, the dilemma is, well, the patient find out during pregnancy, because the diagnosis of the gestational baby is, you know, is not diagnosed during pregnancy, it's developed during pregnancy. So it's kind of a lawyerish term. So the issue, how are we gonna find out these people that have already pre-gestational diabetes, uh, and they come in our, uh, our patient plus. So, well, we do not know. We diagnose it right now. <coughs> but you might want to take a look at the risk factors. I mean, it's, I have to tell you that, you know, including BMI more than 25, I just do, don't have two of those patients, so everybody probably should get the early gestation diabetes. But, you know, you can ask. Family history of diabetes. If the previous baby was large. Gestational diabetes in a pre pregnancy. I mean, obviously, hypertension. Hemoglobin 1C of more than 5.7. If they have a hemoglobin 1C in a pregnant, someone is watching something. So for me, it tells you that you're probably, you're at risk. You know, we don't see too many, you know, uh, random hemoglobin 1C. Someone is, so that actually concerns me that you might be actually a pregestational versus gestational. Uh, polycystic ovary, you know, 10, 15% of the population, polycystic ovary. So you're gonna see you see those, uh, those uh, findings or the clinical uh, features of PCOS. So this is the new, new, new thing. So we're a little more aggressive, try to, to see it's early gestational diabetes, pregestational diabetes. Um, we discussed about insulin. You know, in uh, February 2018, they came with uh, kind of a changing a little bit the standard that we do. We try to do lifestyle modification and pharmacological treatment, but if you do, is the insulin. We use, as we discussed, regular and MPHs and divided doses, requirements depending on gestational age, 0 0.7, 1 1.0. I didn't want to make it too much about it. I didn't expect to have that technical question. But the issue is what gestational age? Well, 24 to 28 weeks. If somehow those patients, you need to put them on insulin towards the end, you know, in the 30s weeks, you just have to give a little bit more. One thing to make, not make them hypoglycemic is, uh, it's very similar, calculate, you know, you put a residence to do it, which is good, or the student nowadays, so it just give you the numbers, and I said, cut it by one-third, because I'm concerned. Put in one-third, we'll follow up, come back in two or three, four days, and figure out if there's no episode of hypoglycemia. You expect that the sugars are not controlled, those numbers, and then just the titrate up based on each individual uh, uh, finger stick. We do this four times a day, fasting, and we use the two hours postprandial. Uh, and this is our number 120 and 95. I have to tell you, when do we switch for us? We, when do we switch to pharmacological, in, you know, we still use a 25 to 30, and it's uh, a number for us to take a look. So, you know, they come with a page for a week with, you know, so many numbers, and then you're gonna start counting how many they're not in this range. When you get to 25 to 30, you know, then you discuss about should I have a pharmacological treatment insulin versus until, you know, a couple of months ago was a gliburide, and nowadays it's more of a metformin. So metformin is a reasonable alternative uh, to insulin for the patient that declined insulin uh, uh, therapy. They cannot afford it, it's a little bit harder to make a point, they cannot use it. Uh, metformin was the other benefits of preeclampsia risk reduction. But, you know, some data showed that you may increase risk of preterm delivery and then when they did this ACOG, uh, you know, they, they always do the analysis and they put some kind of a unpublished trial and they're gonna play a little bit of the data. But the bottom line is, gliburide is out, metformin is in, start using insulin a little bit more for the time being, go with the traditional, you know, regular MPH. I know that Lystro and so on, we don't use it, which, which is kind of different, I guess, in be between the physicians. Uh, and calculate based on gestational age 0 0.7 based on the gestational age to one and cut down by two thirds for two or three days a week 
and then just be aggressive about it from now on, depending how the finger sticks are. So it's much, much simpler. It's, you know, OB is very simple for this perspective. No sensors, no. So as we discussed, gly glyburide is out, and you know, show that you know, we have more macrosomia, neonatal hypoglycemia compared with metformin. So you have to pick and choose. This is not the first line. Uh, postpartum, because they're going to say, well, you know, I don't deal with obese, but they might come to me. Uh, we, what do we have? A dismal way of, of you know, doing the 75 grams postpartum. I, I just have to tell you, I just always wonder. Uh, I don't think I ordered one in the last year, in spite of kind of being aggressive about it, and our patient population is relatively diabetic. Uh, and even one is our, us as physician, and two is even if you give, you know, the nurse, you have, well, you have diabetes, just go with your sugar, they just don't do it. So be a little careful here. So obviously, positive and you're diabetic, you go to Dr. P's clinic. If, you, if you're here, then you're going to have, you know, a little bit more, uh, more things to say. So guess what? The magic one, the wonder drug, you know, metformin, just give you some, uh, some, some metformin. You know, obviously lifestyle, modification, physical activity, you say, hey, listen, you, you're running, you know, your, your sugars are pretty high, just do something about it. And actually, it's a teaching moment. They've been through the pregnancy, they have some issues, you know, and it might be a teaching moment at that time. But interestingly enough, even if you're normal, then you still have to be a little bit careful. If you have gestational diabetes, even if you have the postpartum normal, you know, kind of every one to three year, just be aware of that. I mean, a Hispanic population, if you have gestational diabetes, you have 60% chance in the next five years to develop diabetes. So you have a 32-year-old that just delivered her kid that gestational diabetes, might have or might not have used insulin or medication. So at, 30, at 37, she has 67% chance of having diabetes, a 37-year-old. Well, nowadays, the adolescents, they're diabetic, so. Pre-gestational, uh, that's not good. Uh, significant issues. Um, these are, remember, fetus, neonatal, and, and uh, maternal. Uh, this is a little harder to control, even by regular OBs. Most of our patient population and pre-gestational diabetes, uh, you know, tends to go to 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 MFM. Um, and this is, uh, you know, newly published in 1949. Uh, this is still still we use the Y classification. You know, we discuss gestational A1, the meds, no meds, pre-gestational, and all this letter pending on end organ damage. Um, you just have to be careful, you know, can still manage in this range, uh, but when you're going to go down to retinopathy, pumps, sensors, and everything else, I think it's better to be managed by, by a, a subspecialist. Um, we like the hemoglobin preconception. If you have this patient that so wants to get pregnant, just try to be aggressive together or not with, uh, you know, 6.5. Just be aware of the risk of congenital anomaly. I don't want to look, oh, I like to do 6.5. Just tell her, the baby can have malformation. Uh, your general physician, obviously, do your, uh, you know, eye exam, foot exam, like every other diabetic. And uh, just be aware of, you know, blood pressure, com com you know, with uh, pregestational diabetes, so you have to be more aggressive in controlling it. Um, you know, look for TSH. If it's, you know, this uh, type 1, just in case there's nothing else be behind. Most of the pregestational diabetes, especially the one on, on pumps and, uh, you know, type 1. Remember, you have the pregestational, we can lump them together and divide them based on how long they have the disease. The, you know, the, the regular diabetes, we're looking at them based on type 1 and type 2. Make sure you give them preconception, you know, give them a lot of folic acid, uh, neural tube effects. We say at least 400 prenatal vitamins probably have around 8. Uh, 100 micrograms, so that's fine. If it's possible, change them to insulin and metformin, the new drug. Um, the rest um, of the hypoglycemic uh, agents, they're not, we don't have very good data. So planning out for pregnancy, see if you can switch them to metformin or, uh, or, or insulin. Um, I think that would be my, uh, my recommendation. Pre-gestational, if you switch them to insulin, it's kind of the same uh, concept, it's probably gonna require you know, obviously the insulin increase with the, throughout the pregnancy, so you start with larger dose towards, uh, towards the end and just make sure you measure. Uh, 
this is our kind of standard long and short acting if you be able to manage it um, and definitely come more often to this. Or this on top of all this fetal monitoring that go in the growth scans, biophysical profiles, NST, and the time of the delivery. We tend to deliver them, you know, uh, 39 weeks. Uh, they can go up to 40. The, the one that that's a little bit, you know, just diet control, we tend to let them go a little bit longer, depending how the cervix. It's just the issue is that the risk of induction, the risk of C-section. We have this enormous three, four days prolonged inductions nowadays, and it's just not, it's just not. It, I just thought when you develop iatrogenic uh, high blood pressure, we keep you in IV fluids and in bed for, for two or three days uh, with uh, 150 cc's an hour, you're gonna develop high blood pressure. So then we start treating them for the other disease. Um, baby aspirin, as we discussed. Postpartum, they decline. You know, if they were on an oral regimen, go back on the oral regimen. You can use them in lactation, most of them. The rest uh, are the type of uh, oral medication hasn't been used. So go back, start at two-thirds of pre-pregnancy insulin. If you deliver, have your vaginal delivery, what, how much should I use? Remember, one-third, you just cut off. This is kind of works out. It's very simple in OB. Third trimester, cut by one-third. These are the numbers. And prior oral regimen. Um, caution, diabetic ketoacidosis, higher incidence, less level of hyperglycemia. We're going to talk just two, two things about thyroid disease. What's the time? Yeah, we're still good. Thyroid disease, we're looking, it's relatively common. All the pregnancy kind of started changing all our, uh, uh, you know, the measurements that we have. We have hyperthyroidism. We have over, uh, you know, hyperthyroidism and graves. We have hypothyroidism, subclinical, you know, hypothyroidism. And actually, this is probably the most common that we encounter. You know, the Graves' disease also is relatively uh, common. And watch out, you know, postpartum, uh, 5 to 10% of the very this autoimmune uh, thyroiditis. You know, iodine, you have reasonable amount in, into the, uh, in the prenatal vitamin, but should be from the diet. Kind of these are the suggested uh, doses in lactating versus pregnant. And one, co uh, uh, co we know that in pregnancy, a lot of things are growing. You know, it's, a, it's an area that, you know, the belly grows, everything, the gums are growing, so on. If the, if the thyroid, the goiter grows, that's not normal. That needs to be investigated. So we're a little bit careful. Said so always because of the pregnancy, the people said breasts are enlarging, this are enlarging, you know, the moles and all these epithelial polyps are growing, gums, you know, and said, oh, that's fine, that's fine. But the goiter is enlarged. Just something is not right, so make sure you do some form of evaluation. Um, we know a little bit of physiology. Uh, just be a little bit careful, you know, here that, you know, how we do our measurements. SEG goes up, then we have, you know, the problem with the TSH goes down in this range. You know, 3T4, is, it's up. So when you measure, just keep that in mind. Also, it just tells you that, you know, the, it's a fetal dependency of maternal thyroid in the first trimester. So if you want to do something in thyroid, if you have hypothyroid, just be a, a, a patient. Just make sure as a primary care physician, just increase the dose by the time they see the, the, the OBGYN, that they might do a match. What we usually do, if you only increase the dose, we are aware you know how to manage it. So usually we send you back to you just to manage it yourself rather than for us to do it. I just, I, it's very interesting. If you don't change it, said, hmm, probably they don't know what they're doing, so let me do it. So uh, we discussed about increasing the ACG. We have increasing the free T4 and TSH, and all these are the, the, the changes into, into the, you know, physiology in pregnancy. There's some cutoffs that we use. I have to tell you, if you maintain your somewhere between two, 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 three, it's a pretty good number. Um, be aware of some things happen in pregnancy. Um, and, and you might see them and you don't know they're pregnant. So for me, it's every, any pregnant woman that comes to you and have with a complaint, young, or not non-pregnant, just make sure to check a pregnancy test. So you have, be aware of the hyperemesis gravidarum, we call it transient hyperthyroidism. You might have just plain gestational hyperthyroidism just related to the increased SCG, which is kind of different kind of obstetrical. It might be in a molar pregnancy, it might be in twins. And, you know, sometimes how are you going to diagnose the, the, the difference? Well, I mean, obviously, if you have hyperemesis, you vomit more than in graves. 
and just look basically at the thyroid receptor antibodies. That's going to tell you a lot where you're going to go. You have Graves or you have some other uh, transient events. Um, you know, we divide it simple. Overt hyperthyroidism, subclinical, overt, you know, you always like to be higher than lower in pregnancy. So that's one of the issues. I'd rather have a little more thyroid than less thyroid. So just over hypothyroidism, really you want to, you know, you have the increased TSH, really try to, 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 to aggressively treat. Obviously, hyperthyroidism has its own complication, but it's almost giving you some more, some more time to think about it. Uh, adverse outcomes from hyperthyroidism, you have um, low birth third miscarriage, preeclampsia, placental abruption. You know, it's not necessarily associated. So remember, if you're a little bit high, it's not the worst case scenario. Um, but just be aware of that. If you're really in this range, you know, you have this uh, the graves can, you know, cross the placenta, can create, you know, fetal graves. So it's also the fetal outcome. What do we use? You know, use the MMI, MPTU. Uh, we don't like the MMI during the first trimester. We try to switch to PTU. Keep your free T4, this will check to upper uh, uh, level of normal. So remember, you have your metimazole, you, you're not pregnant, then find out you're pregnant, try to switch to PTU. Second trimester, switch back to metimazole. It's kind of a going back, that's kind of a job in itself. And then you just watch out for the decrease in dosage and make sure you keep this free T4. You check it every couple of weeks or so. Generally speaking, we manage this together with endocrinology. Uh, preconception, uh, we like to be, uter uh, you know, uteroid state. We like to have a 2.5 if it's, if it's feasible. A uh, couple of other issues, watch out, it's just in case the patient has a radionine ablation, you know, within 12 months, do not get pregnant. Um, you want, if you really need to be achieve a uteroid status, probably surgery is the best. We haven't had a case in a long time. Uh, this actually you can see, It'll just make sure, the most important if you have that, put them on contraception, you know, for at least a year for us to prevent. Um, you can switch, we discuss, switch to, to PTU in the uh, first trimester, don't use MMI. Postpartum, remember the magic PTU first trimester, the rest you can use metimazole. Um, you can have some postpartum thyroiditis. Um, what else? A lot of this postpartum type does resolve by itself, just kind of follow it up, um, usually achieve a uteroid state in 3 to 12 months. Hypo, this uh, poor adverse uh, outcomes, uh, mixed for subclinical. If it, the TSH is not so bad, don't worry. No conclusive evidence that subclinical fight improves the pregnancy, the treatment improves the uh, pregnancy outcome. We use levothyroxine. You, we check every four to six uh, weeks and we adjust accordingly. Um, and be aware of people with low thyroid reserve, they really need a little more than the, in the first trimester. First trimester is magic for a lot of things. Be aggressive and be very liberal. What we usually do, we increase uh, um, by you know, one third, or we ask two, three extra doses uh, that uh, per week. Um, Screening for hypothyroidism is not recommended by ACOG, but at the same time, they give you a very long list of things that you can potentially screen. In our practice, we do not particularly screen for, for, uh, for, um, uh, for thyroid. So well, this is probably the most important thing from the thyroid. It's almost the graves. It's a little bit kind of tricky. You have to be aware. We can work with the subspecialists. But as a primary care physician, you get pregnant, increase by 25 to 30 percent, you know, after the first menstrual cycle. Go for TSH. If somehow the patient is already on medication, it should be around to 2.5. Sometimes, you know, you want to go for the infertility uh, data. They add this very small amount of levothyroxine just to kind of keep this number around 2.5. So hypothyroid patient on medication, just try to adjust the dose to going to go to in this range. Um, Pre-pregnancy dose, most of the people end up having the same amount post-delivery. Um, we check it around six to two uh, weeks when they come, we send them out. Or you say, listen, I, don't, I cannot adjust your dose, you, I won't see you and see your primary, especially if you took care of your, your thyroid. 
but some TSH postpartum needs to be checked. And the last word, but you know, this is one slide, weight management, I know it's not easy to fix. In pregnancy, 25 to 35, it's allowed increase. You know, if you have more than that, you have adverse obstetrical outcome, both maternal and, and fetal. You have to tell the patient that the weight gain, you know, and retention post-pregnancy, this is what we call the interconception, predisposed to maternal obesity. And these are like, a, you know, a little bit of, you know, numbers. You have, in six months, if you lose the weight from the previous delivery, in the next 10 years, you have a chance at 2.5, weight gain versus if you don't lose your, pre, if you don't come back to your pre-pregnancy weight, you have a chance of 18 pounds of weight in the next 10 years. So it's a significant amount. Sometimes you may put it on the paper, people might pay attention. But remember, a lot of our patient population, they already have a high pre-pregnancy way to start with, they tend to be ill with them. And the other thing that you have to, to let them know, I said, you know, if you're obese, you know, your, your children have a pretty good likelihood to be, to be obese. And that's not an easy, that's, that's not an easy fix. So conclusion, I think it's an opportunity uh, for, for, for us to work with the primary physicians. I think we shouldn't be concerned or be afraid to use a lot of antihypertensive medication. We shouldn't be afraid to use the insulin. Metformin is the new wonder drug. Remember PTU, first trimester, otherwise you can use MMIs. Graves disease, work with, uh, with um, you know, definitely you should work with uh, um, some or an MFM or, uh, or uh, uh, endocrine. And hypothyroidism, I think that's the other thing, just, just give them some more, give them a couple of extra doses. See if you can come closer to 2.5. And it's an opportunity to collaborate with the primary. And we haven't particularly successfully done in our practice either, so. I think, uh, thank you, and any questions? Yeah, I've got one over here. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, uh, if you are screening for thyroid in pregnancy, do you re recommend drawing a TPO? No, actually we do screen just with uh, a TSH and free T4. Uh, if that becomes, because, you know, you know the testing in a pregnancy becomes a little bit uh, uh, tricky. So we're looking at a free T4 and a test. You're looking mostly for hypothyroidism or you have suspicion of, uh, of uh, hyper also? Uh, because just, just as a gen general screening for someone screening, with risk factors. So be a little bit careful because the screening is not for thyroid disease. The screening is for hypothyroidism. Okay. So, you know, if you have suspicions, you know, that you do have, be careful because in the first trimester when you have, you're going to have all those a little bit of, a little bit of over hyperthyroidism related to this SCG and so on. So how you interpret that data needs to be a little bit clear. So I wouldn't particularly. If it's almost the other way around, if they come with, uh, you know, hyperemesis and you, they don't respond, we send for thyroid and we just try to, you know, uh, antibodies and try to kind of check the thyroid uh, status that way, but not as a screening. The screening, I think, is more for the hypothyroidism, which is, you know, two to five percent of the population. Hyperthyroidism is like, what, 0 0.1, so the likelihood for you to find out with the screening with relatively expensive tests, it's just not, it's not worth it. If you have a patient that's had a history of thyroid cancer, I'm so, okay, sorry. sorry. And um, she becomes pregnant, what do you want her levels to be? So uh, she, she, well. She had her thyroid removed to yeah, her thyroid yes. cancer, yeah. So what doses is she on? Usually it tend to be a, a she had a thyroidectomy. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and we, the, the thyroid, you know, still our try to kind of reach out that, you know, TSH of 2.5 if we can. The problem with this patient population, they really, uh, no, you don't disagree with that? 